image matters, doesn't it? We should all be shaking our heads yes. Because I know when I got up this morning, I'm like, okay, I got to put on something nice. I found a nice shirt. I looked in the mirror and did what I could with my hair, right? The moussey, because it's got an E on an end, so we should pronounce it as French. And I tried to hide the early balding stages that I'm currently going through. Uh, image matters in our life. We want to make sure that when we look in the mirror and we go out in public, that we look our best. Uh, this could be when we look in the mirror, right? That, that image, um, it may be how people perceive us. We want to we wanna give something out that when people look at us, they see someone who's important or someone who is valued. Image matters in our lives, the way we view ourselves and even the way other people view us. Um, and I think especially over the last 10 years, um, culture has put a high value on self and self-image, right? The, I, I was looking, I was doing some research, and over the last 10 years, the amount of self-help books has increased 10% every year. It's, it's always increased. In, in about 2012, 2010 to 2012, there were 30,000 different um, self-help books out there, specific books for self-help. In 10 years following that, it got up to 80,000 self-help. It's, it's only increased since that time. People want to figure out, okay, how do, how do I make my appearance better? How do I make the way people perceive me better? Self-help has been one of those things where it, it can be from weight loss, right, the, to how we, how we look, um, to being, trying to be the best businessman in the world, or becoming mindful of the things around us, right? We've seen that language come up and around in our culture, but most of this really centers around how we look and how others view us. Um, and as I was playing around with like doing some research on what self-help looked at looks like, I went on Google and I typed in how to. And have, have any of you like started asking a question and like Google like fill it in? And it's, it's always interesting because either Google knows what you're trying to do because they like track yourself or, or it's a trend that everyone is searching this thing. So I go on Google and I type in how to and one of the first ones that pops up is how to Google something. And I was in Google. And I was concerned that that was a direct um, <laughs> insult against me and I didn't know how to take it so I moved on quickly. But how to, we talked about that a few weeks ago, right? How to, how to become a better person, how to look better, how to lose weight, self-help. That is something that has just engulfed our culture. Um, and it's been something that has engulfed, I feel like, culture for years. More so in the last 10 years, but even tracking back to biblical times, and we're going to talk about a king who, who probably cared about that a little bit too much. But before we jump into that story, um, just a quick comment on where we've been. So far this summer, we have been in a series called The Throne, and we've looked through the story of King David and what the throne, um, what Israel looked like under him. Um, we just recently got done with King Solomon, and we know that the really just the splendor of King Solomon, right? He had great wealth, he had great knowledge, he had great wisdom, um, but towards the end of Solomon's reign, he ended up taking a lot of foreign wives. And with those foreign wives came foreign gods, and we see just the start of the kingdom starting to divide because of these foreign gods starting to come into the land of Israel. Now at this point, Solomon dies, and it is passed on to the throne, then is passed on to the next king named King Rehoboam. And we're going to jump into a story in Chronicles. Now, if you've been reading devotions with us, if you've been going through the marathon with us, you'll notice that we've, over the last week, we've been jumping back and forth between kings and chronicles. And some of those stories have sounded very similar to each other. Now, if you're Familiar with the Gospels, which is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all stories about the life of Jesus when he was on earth. And it was just from different perspectives. There's stories in those four books that appear in all of the books. And so, some of the stories don't appear in any of them. It's just one of the books. 
We know that because it's, it's just different perspectives of their view of who Jesus was and, and how uh, they lived life with Jesus. In the same way, Kings and Chronicles are from different perspectives, telling a very similar story. Kings is written from the perspective of the prophets, and it, it almost has more of a, uh, a tone of judgment, and it, it has more of a negative tone to it because it's speaking from the prophets who are warning Israel and Judah about what might be to come if they don't obey what God has said. Chronicles, on the other hand, is written from more the perspective of the priests, um, specifically after, after captivity. So Kings would have been written first and then Chronicles follows after that. But this message, because it's from the priests, are looking more on the tone of like reconciliation and hope and how do we get back on track with who God is and what he's done in our lives. But both books overall show the direct relationship between people and God and how to get that back on track. It's just different perspectives in it. So saying that, we're going to jump today in the Chronicles story of it from 2 Chronicles 10, 16 to 19. And if you read devotions, this was one of, that, one of the things you read, so this is going to sound familiar to you. It says this out of 2 Chronicles 10, 16 to 19. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king. And this, at this point, is King Rehoboam. Okay? What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel. Look after your own house, David. Which they're pretty much saying, okay, it, it's every man for himself at this point. So all the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam sent out to Ed, um, Adonai, oh man, Adoniram, something like that, who was in charge of forced labor, labor. But the Israelites stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to that day. Oh my word. Right, did you read that? And after the few weeks that we've been looking through with, with King David and King Solomon, the, the nation has always been in a pretty decent spot. Right, There have been low points, but all of a sudden we get to a story where the, all the people are saying it's every man for himself and they're, they're stoning um, messengers from the king like, what is happening? How did we get to this point? Uh, people used to look up to the king and respect him and go to him for guidance. And when King Rehoboam steps in, it, there is a very different tone in, in the kingdom. And that answer comes a few verses before. We're going to look out of 2 Chronicles 10. It says this right at the beginning of 2 Chronicles 10, verse 1. Rehoboam, Rehoboam sent to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. So this is right after King Solomon died, they are going to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon, he returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and all of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father, he put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. So what we're finding here is that uh, Jeroboam is saying to Rehoboam that, hey, uh, your dad put a heavy yoke on us at times. And I, I've talked to all of Israel. They're all coming with me. If you lighten that load, we will be your servants. We will serve you well. And Rehoboam answered, come back to me in three days. So the people went away. Then Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. At this point in uh, Rehoboam's reign, he is 41 years old. When, when he takes the throne, he's 41 years old. So what is interesting is we know that Rehoboam probably looked up to his father Solomon to watch how he ruled the kingdom for 30 plus years to the point where he was able to watch that, right, and see how he reigned. He probably heard stories about King David, his grandpa, and how 
how King David would serve and how he reigned and how he brought the advisors in to gain wisdom from them and ask about tough decisions in the kingdom, being surrounded by a council that could give wisdom. Um, so Rehoboam's doing this, right? He's asking that council of elders, okay, I've, I've got this situation. How do I move forward from it? So it's actually really good. They replied to him, if you will be kind to these people and please them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servant. Ah, oh, great advice. I think this is good. Uh, verse 8, but Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. It's pretty much, he calls in his buddies and say, hey, I've got this going on. He asks them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young man who had grown up with him replied, the people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, and I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with rip, whips, and I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all of the people returned to Rehoboam, and as the king had told them, come back to me in three days. The king answered them harshly, rejecting the advice of the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, and I will scourge you with scorpions. So what we find is that Rehoboam completely rejected the advice of the elders and the advice of the wise counsel that he had. And he called in his buddies and he listened to what they had to say. Have you ever wanted something, right? And you know you should probably ask permission from someone or get advice from somebody. And you're like, okay, I, I need to at least least do my due diligence and ask someone um, if this is a good idea. All right, I've been in that spot. I enjoy history stuff. I like, um, especially like the gas and oil world, like um, American Pickers. I love, that's one of my favorite shows. But like, I like collecting oil cans and signs. It's ridiculous. My wife is probably shaking her head somewhere. But I, I just love that stuff. Now, if there's a sign that comes up that I want to buy, that I want to put on the wall, wise counsel would tell me to go, I should go to Jalen and say, hey, is now an okay time to buy a sign, right? Can we financially make this happen? Is it the best use of our money right now? Um, but if I want a yes, I'm not going to go to my wife, right? There have been times where a sign comes up and I'm like, I don't think I'm going to tell her. And then I go to my cousin because I, I do feel like I should probably ask, right? I, I do feel the conviction to ask advice from somebody. And I go to my cousin who also collects gas and oil stuff and loves signs. And his advice to me in the past is, you know, one sign is good, but two signs would be better. Instead of just buying one, you should buy two, right? And oh, that's the advice I was, that, that you're right. I should go and buy two signs instead of just one. That's, that's great advice. Or maybe I've been in situations where if I wanted to buy something with wheels, like a motorcycle, I go to my buddies who have toys with wheels and say, hey guys, I'm thinking about buying this motorcycle. What are your thoughts? And you know their answer, right? Of of course you should buy a motorcycle. That'll be so much fun. You'll enjoy it. You'll use it all the time. It'll be great. Wise counsel would probably tell me, you've got two kids in diapers. The last thing you should be buying right now is a motorcycle, right? But I go to the people sometimes that I know how they're going to answer. So I find the people that are going to give me the answer that I'm looking for so I can kind of check that off my list of, well, I did seek guidance, right? I did seek advice, and I just followed that. Um, think back to the story of Rehoboam, right? He saw the advice and the wisdom from the elders. He didn't like it, so he found somebody who would have his same language, right? He found some buddies that he grew up with, and he knew that they would tell him the answer he was looking for. What happened when he didn't get the advice he was given? He found the advice he wanted from someone else. See, do you notice 
what Rehoboam was after. Right, when we look back to, and we think back to image and self-image, I can, I really think that Rehoboam was after his image, right? He wanted to appear more powerful. He wanted, when Israel looked up to him, to fear him. He wanted to be more of a man than his father ever was, and he wanted people to fear who he was. See, I think if we, if we're looking for someone to give us the advice that we want to hear, we probably already know that that's not something that we should be doing, right? If you're convicted by the Holy Spirit to be like, hey, I'm, I should go to somebody to seek guidance on the situation, you probably know that if you're filling in the gap with somebody who you know is already going to tell you what you want, that that is already the first red flag, but is this not something that culture has just told us to do? Right? The exact opposite of seeking wisdom. Or we may, we may seek guidance, but from people that we know are going to give us the guidance that we're looking for. Right? Our culture is screaming at us to accept me for who I am or become your best self according to yourself. Whatever that yourself is telling you, right? Like culture screams that language at us and we know who to go to if we want that language spoken back to us. And if we look through all of scripture from the beginning of time to the story of Rehoboam to our lives now, the tactics of the devil have yet to change. The devil is always trying to persuade people and pursue people with uh, power wealth and influence, right? If, if he is trying to gain people and get their ear tuned to him, those are the three things that we're seeing laid out in here. It's often power, wealth, and influence. And when we look at the story of Rehoboam, we see all of those things being played out, right? Rehoboam has looked up to his father David He's looked up to his father Solomon, or his grandfather David, his father Solomon, and he sees the influence they had, and he wants way more than that. The devil's probably in his ear saying, if you're harsh on them, they will ha you'll have way more influence in their life. Think now a minute. What is the devil in your ear saying? Is there anything that the devil is promising to you? Wealth, power, influence in your life. Um, there's a verse that uh, you read in devotions as well this week coming out of Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and it speaks really clearly to how we should be responding to situations like this. It says this, Philippians 2, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider with God something to be used, or did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, being taken the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, our best self, when we think back to our image, our best self is the one that is being formed, transformed more and more into the image of God, uh, and more and more into the image of Christ Jesus. See, I would argue that we are constantly being transformed into something, right? Our lives are being bombarded with something, so we are always maybe adapting and transforming more into something, and if it's not for Christ Jesus, if, we're, if our eyes are not towards him to model the life that he gave us, our eyes are on something else. Our ear is tuned to the devil saying wealth, power, influence, money, right? It, we're being transformed more into what this culture is throwing at us, what the world wants us to be. If our ear is not to Christ Jesus, it's being transformed into something else. And I think Jesus models what, what this life really looks like really well in John 2. Um, John 2, it's one of the Gospels, right? In the beginning, we talked about uh, the different perspectives of the Gospels, just like it is in Kings and Chronicles. This book is from the perspective of one of the disciples named John. And at this point in the story, John 2, 
There is a wedding that happens. And all the disciples are invited. Jesus is invited to the wedding. And at this wedding, Jesus performs a miracle. And he he really gains the attention of all the disciples. And all the disciples are so excited of what Jesus has done. He gains... It appears as though Jesus gains a lot of influence because of that miracle that takes place. Shortly after that, a few verses later, Jesus finds himself in the temple where he is clearing the tables because people are selling things in the temple courts and they're exchanging goods. And Jesus explains, this is not okay. And he angers a ton of people. But what I love about that chapter in John is that Jesus only cares about what his father tells him to do, right? Regardless of making people happy or making people angry, that is not, Jesus doesn't hold their opinions, right? He doesn't, he's not worried about what the disciples think or what the people in the temple courts think. He is worried about what his father thinks, He's not swayed by people liking him or disliking him. It says actually clearly in John 2 verse 24, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, being the people, for he knew all the people. See, I think we need to understand this. If Jesus did not entrust himself to people, right? If Jesus did not worry about the opinions of people, whether it be his closest friends or the the people in the temple courts, we should not either. Our lives should be so much so modeled after Jesus Christ that even our best friends, if Jesus tells us to do something and it's different than our friends, we have to go with what the word of God tells us. So maybe you're out there thinking, okay, Matt, that's all great, but how, how do we actually live that out in my life? There's actually a really good Um, how-to book that describes this well. It's the Bible, right? This is our how-to book. When we're looking at our lives, we should be going to the Word of God. We should be looking at the story of Jesus and seeing how he models it, just like he does in John 2. Um, Don't surround yourself with people who are going to give you the answers that you're looking for, right? Often, We have people in our lives, and often it just naturally happens because we we enjoy people who are like-minded, right? And and that's great, and that's okay. But if we're looking for advice, and we're looking for counsel and guidance, and we're going to those people because we know they'll give us the answer we're looking for, that's, that's not the direction we should be going in. See, get in a group. If you're going to do anything out of this, get in a group. Surround yourself with people who are also in the word of God that will point you into the direction that God may be, may be sending you in. Even if it's a hard truth. Right? Sometimes I think guidance from God isn't always easy. And sometimes it's hard to hear. But we should be surrounding ourselves with people. Like, like think about the story of Rehoboam. He brought in the council, the wise elders from his father's era, asked them a question, and he heard a truth that he didn't want to hear. Right? There are going to be times in our lives where we're told things that we just may not want to hear, that we don't want to move forward and, and do. But if we surround ourselves with those people that we know are in the word of God and we know are seeking God's wisdom, then then our lives are going to be fruitful because of that. Do things according to God's word, not according to your best self trying to be your best self. See, the last thing I want to land with today is understanding that even when we get to that point, right, even when we've surrounded ourselves with godly people and godly wisdom and we're in the word of God, even when we do those things, the battle is not necessarily over. It doesn't necessarily just get easier out of that. Um, there's a story um, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13 where there's a man of God who goes to King Rehoboam and tells him a truth that's going to be happening, um, something that's going to be coming, and that happens. And the king says, uh, why don't you come and ha- have some drink and have some food with me? In, in my house. And the man of God replies to him and says, no, 
God actually told me to give you this word and I'm supposed to leave without eating anything or drinking anything and I'm supposed to go a different way back. And the king says, okay, all right, whatever. So the, the man of God leaves. Now a different man uh, goes and pursues that man of God. And he goes up to him and he says, and he's lying here, okay, uh, God actually told me that you're supposed to come back and eat and drink with us, right? You sh- so you should come and do that. So that man of God um, doesn't, he, he goes back on what God specifically told him and he listens to that man. And he goes back and that man of God ends up being killed because he didn't listen to what God was directing him. It, it, it's kind of a gruesome story. But we need to understand that even if we have God's guidance, even if we know what we're supposed to do, that doesn't mean the battle is over. We have to constantly be on guard for what the world is going to throw at us. Because in those moments, I think the devil is going to throw everything he can at us to get us off track from what God is trying to direct into our lives. So even when we get to this point, we need to understand, continue to fight. If you know what God has told you to do, if what God has told you is biblical and you can back it against the word of God, go with that and do not stop regardless of what you're told from the world around you. If you know it's from God, go with what God tells you. Um, God's plan for our life is never to live our best self or live our best self according to our best selves. It's according to the word of God. And it's according to the model that Jesus has in our lives and that we should be continued to be transformed more and more into his image. When we think about the story of Rehoboam, take that to account. Understand that this world is throwing so much at us, throwing so much about what it means to be our best self. And we cannot tune our ear to those things because Satan will use those words to trick us into thinking, okay, if you do these things, there's wealth, there's power, there's influence that'll come out of that, right? Tune your ear to the word of God. Tune your ear to the model that Jesus has in our lives so that you can be continued to be transformed more and more into his image. I want to end with this. Who is on your throne? Right? Who is on your throne? Is it your best self according to yourself or according to the word or is it who God has called you to be? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for your word. And I thank you um, that you've given us this word that we can tune our ears to and tune our hearts to to understand the direction that you've given in our lives. God, I ask that you give us the courage to say no to what culture is throwing at us. To say no to even what our friends may be throwing at us. That the devil may be be whispering in our ears. God, I just ask that you give us the courage to stand against those things and stand firm into what you may be speaking us to do right now. God, I... I ask that you give us the strength to move forward. Even when we have that wisdom, I ask that you give us the strength to understand that we're still going to, the world is still going to throw things at us. God, give us the strength to stand against that and stand firm and be rooted into your word and your guidance. God, I thank you for that to lean on. In your name we pray, amen.